So, um, good evening everyone. Sorry for the slight delay today. One of my professors once told me that there's three things you should never play with, and that's children, animals, and technology. So, we apologize in advance if there is any hiccups in technology. Um, so, today's talk is one of the first. Laurie's come to do a talk for the Birmingham School of the Built Environment, but we've also extended our invitation to our architecture students as well. And what we're hoping to get out of today's talk is to open up a discussion between architects, designers, and some of the graduates from the Birmingham School of the Built Environment to kind of show you light and insight into what the design process is and kind of tell you that there is a method to this madness. And for our architecture students, I'd like to say that hopefully this will provide you some sort of inspiration for your future projects within university or outside when you're actually working in the industry. And for our external guests, well, this is more of a timeline and inspiration for you to see what's behind the design ethos of Chetwoods as a company. And so without further ado, yeah, I've got Laurie Chetwood here for you. Right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much uh, for inviting me here. I'm uh, from Birmingham, as it happens. I was born and bred in Yenton uh, till I was about 11, and I fled to the south, hence the slightly posher accent. But nevertheless, I loved it in Birmingham and uh, glad to be back. And we have an office in Birmingham and one in London, so just to give you some background. The plan for today is to end up with this project, uh, which is fairly current, um, and then show you over the some 20, 25 years that we've been around how that has happened. And funnily enough, there are quite a lot of clues along the way that feed into that uh, huge project which um, is heading for being built in the not too distant future. So if we start um, back in when I was 15 or so, uh, hang on, I could do that, can't I? Um, I was much more into art than architecture. I was... Uh, uh, a child of the sort of 60s, I suppose, and you can see some of that in the art. It's a bit post-flower power, sort of post-pre-Raphaelite, you know, the sort of thing. And uh, I loved art, and my, unfortunately my dad was a contractor. He was a builder, uh, going places, living in Birmingham, and uh, sheepskin coat and a jag, that sort of thing. And uh, he wasn't so keen on the idea of art. But on the other hand, he wasn't so keen on architects either. I'd spent a lot of time uh, in summer holidays, working on building sites, uh, getting to know, getting the feel of the, the more or less hatred that, that the contractors have for architects. And, um, and especially if you're the boss's son, of course, that didn't go down well either, particularly. So I got, I got the hang of it pretty early on, that, uh, that contractors didn't like architects. And also, I got the hang of the fact that the beautiful drawings we all produce uh, end up on a building site with a guy in uh, severe weather conditions, with concrete and tools which are messy and dirty and it's a hard life. So those beautiful drawings that we have, we have always got to bear in mind that there's, it's going to end up in a sort of muck and bullets environment. Um, and it's well worth getting some experience on site. So that's the first sort of top tip for today. Get onto the site to see what, how it all ends up because it'll, it'll open your eyes. But the, the reason for telling the story is that, so that my dad's given me the sort of earache more or less all the time about how awful architects were and that they didn't do this, that and the other. Then he suggested I might like to become one, which was uh, for me a bit of a setback. But I took his advice and I think I probably did the right thing. The good thing about art is obviously you just can do more or less what you like and it's, uh, it's, it's up to you and there's not many people who, um, who really restrict you. Architecture is an incredibly long-winded, uh, quite pedantic profession. And uh, uh, I think I only wish it could go quicker and uh, that's possibly something behind uh, some of those drawings and behind the previous project which was this whiff of wow quick um, which is unusual in the UK so some of the projects you'll see as we go through have hauled themselves across the line um, next this is one of them so we, I set up a business anyway, eventually. I, I did my everything that everybody's doing at the moment. Um, I uh, did it down in Brighton. It was great fun, good laugh, really good place to be. Um, did quite well. Got a job with a commercial practice and then said to my dad, can you give me some money so I can set up a business? And he lent me the money and I had to pay it back with triple interest actually, but it, at least he got his money back. 
Um, we set off in the early, well, early 90s, late 80s, where there was a massive recession on. And we got into supermarkets, not because we wanted to, because we had to. We were seen as like, almost like the tarts of the profession. We'd do anything for anybody because we had to survive. And I'm sure some of you have noticed that in the last few recessions. It's really quite been tough. And those, re those recessions have sort of hit in waves for more or less every 10 years. So it's been quite a struggle. But we, we got onto the supermarket side and we managed to produce... Uh, a pretty good store which got onto the shortlist sterling prize uh, in 2000 and, and that was the sort of culmination of our commercial push if you like and it, and it paid the mortgage but at the same time we've got a little sort of saying you've got to try and pay the mortgage but also impress the peer group very difficult to do in architecture in the UK <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, as soon as you start impressing the peer group, you start you start losing money because you, we all start designing. You've all done these projects where you spent too long on them and you get drawn <laughs> into them, and that's that's the slight problem. But it was nevertheless uh, every so often a jewel comes along or an opportunity, a bit like an actor, you know, they'll get the the dream role. Well, sometimes that happens, and it happened with us with the the Millennium Store. At the same time, I continued with the art, and this is one of the first ones I did for a charity called Art Article Twenty Five, which is a a charity which looks after uh, building projects in the, in the third world and uh, basically what they do is they give a, an artist or an architect in London a square, uh, a, not literally a square, a geographical square um, to, to actually illustrate and this one was quite close to where we are in Clerkenwell, Gin Lane. Um, which is based on the sort of Hogarth picture as you can see on the left, you remember that Gin Lane which was uh, going through the ills of I think 17th century or 18th century London. And I thought I'd bring that up to date, which you can see in some of the details there. And that, that gets sold for charity. So my endeavours here were to try and keep in touch with the paying the mortgage bit, but also to, to keep impressing the pig and keep my, my hopes of art alive. And that came on with another idea, which was this uh, was Butterfly House, which is the house I did for my family, all architects really enjoy doing their own houses because once again they are the client you're missing out the client who's telling you what to do you are that person and if you've got the money or even if you haven't got the money you have a certain amount of control you obviously have to get around planning in this case uh well i was the client uh we did have a few bob at the time and we ignored the planning, which was uh, quite interesting. It was brilliant uh, because it slowly, it was a sort of one of those uh, by stealth. Um, we, uh, we won planning permission by one vote with a completely different scheme to this. Um, we ended up um, just simply adding to the thing as it went along. And eventually the local authority used it as a backdrop for one of the political, well, it was Bottomley, I think, Virginia Bottomley's sort of uh, election special. So it was sort of accepted, even though it hadn't got, actually got planning permission. So as you can see, in a very quiet, leafy site in Surrey, um, this was obviously quite extraordinary for a, a very traditional village, Surrey village. Um, but it was a really enjoyable to do. It's a lot of art in this. It's, I spent a lot of time, I saved a lot of money by doing a lot of it myself in terms of the art and the sculpture. And... Uh, we, d we did pretty well with it. Now we're going to need a, a bit of an animation here. We've had a bit of trouble with the, the graphics here, but um, uh, it's a very quick video of, of the Butterfly House. It's an existing house right on the edge of the Surrey-Sussex border. Great view. Um, that's not it. Don't worry. Um, and, and the interesting thing, what I did was my, my wife's brother works for a firm called Flying Pictures, which is run by an ex-Vietnam Vietnam, uh, helicopter pilot. And they do all the filming for all the films like Harry Potter, um, you know, some of the James Bond aerial views. And is that working? No, carry on. Okay. Um, so, uh, so I'll just tell you another story. So this is a very quiet place. I think it's one of the quietest places in South East England. Uh, and I said, do you think you get a helicopter to film it? Brilliant. Um, so this is the sort of the house itself, uh, which is eventually going to start going. So I'll just give you a quick blitz through this because it ends up with this at nighttime shot from a helicopter that came in. And I thought it was going to be one of those little sort of tiny little things, just zip around quietly, take a bit of footage. But it more or less was a Chinook that came in. And I could hear it from about, I don't know, 10 miles away. It got a throbbing noise in them, and it was, all the dogs started barking and people... You know, it was like a cartoon almost. And, uh, 
Uh, anyway, it film, this isn't quite such a good resolution in terms of the, um, the actual film, but it's pin sharp. Be careful what you're doing at home if anybody's flying over the top because it can pick at anything. So if we move it on a bit, um, oh, it's actually going quite quickly, just, just to about here. Yes, so, yes, there's it from the top. So this is an existing house. I, I altered it as much as I possibly could because the planners wouldn't let me knock it down. But there's no way they let me do that actually what you see there and it was uh, it's great because it's a bit of guile you, you really do have to when you get out out and start practicing a lot of you are already I'm sure you've got to get through three hurdles in the UK one is got to find a really good client who actually is with it and has some money and wants to do something with the money to put something back then you've got to get through a local authority who that is quite a task, so you've really got to use your wits. So lots of salesmanship and practice at that. But one of the biggest trip, trip ups is the fact that you then have the builder to get round. And, and they're all obviously working to a budget, depends on the procurement route. But those three things are massive hurdles which, which trip all of us up from time to time. Okay, so from there, again, we decided to put some our money where our mouth is and we invested in. Uh, the environmental side. We'd really enjoyed doing the, the Greenwich store, which was the greenest supermarket in the world, as they called it. And we decided to do a project for the Clerkenwell Festival, which is the precursor of the London Festival of Architecture. And we came up with a, a little uh, installation, which was environmental and social. It was to try and put something back into London, into a square in London, but also to demonstrate how you can use passive energy in a fun and useful way. So this was a uh, an installation which actually folded up and then opened out like a flower, like an alpine flower, to pick up daylight, use the power from the daylight and put it down on the ground for the people around the installation. So we had uh, several points where people could play instruments, you had a sort of fairly crude air conditioning system because it was done in the summer, we had music, um, uh, several other issues. Now all the photovoltaics which you can sort of see, oh, sorry, which you can see on the petals, I thought it was going to be brilliant. We were going to run all this stuff. We were going to have concerts and everything else. And I said to the um, Arabs, how much power are we actually going to get from that? And they said, about as much as a, uh, you can run a laptop from. Okay? <laughs> so <laughs> I said, all right, we're, we're going to have to think again. Uh, we'll get, we get a fuel cell in, which we did. We got a hydrogen fuel cell, one of the few in the country at the time, and installed it. And we got it for a week. And it did all the power we wanted. It was brilliant. We, it was actually something that worked. Um, but unfortunately, they, they wanted it back after a week. So for about the three months this thing was running, it was, there was a cable that ran from there into our office. And unfortunately, it wasn't quite as environmentally uh, sound as we, we'd hoped. But it was still a good experiment. And we took it to the Chelsea Flower Show a year later as part of a, a gold medal winning uh, design, which uh, again had its moments when the BBC were filming it, it crashed. And uh, the most extreme pressure I've ever, ever had that was. Judges were co literally coming up that way. BBC had this huge boom camera filming it and all the petals went crunch. And, uh, we ha and it was on a Sunday, so all the team were having their roast dinners and all that sort of thing. And uh, we ended up getting them out. The whole team pulled together and we saved the day and uh, we were successful in the end. So it was, it was good fun. But that's the, uh, the... We have got a little animation again before we go on to the Zeta. I'll, I've got to keep it reasonably quick. Um, but uh, this is ju it's just quite nice looking it open. I don't know if anybody did actually see it, but um, it did eventually go to a number of venues. It went uh, from, obviously it went to Chelsea Flower Show, then it went up to Manchester, it came into Birmingham, Brindley Place, and then it went down to uh, Cannes, funnily enough, and was put out in front of one of the posh hotels. And uh, we made no money out of it at all, but we had a bloody good time. And uh, uh, part of our whole ethos, Erica mentioned what, what is our... What is the ethos here? We're really, really quite interested in making sure people are enjoying themselves and having a good time. I think if people are enjoying themselves, they're probably doing a good job and eventually uh, things start to work. So you can see it slowly opened and the idea was that that would respond to daylight. First thing, we had a, a wind turbine in the middle and uh, that was good. I actually really, really enjoyed that and uh, it was a bit, Heath Robinson, I suppose. But if you want to, can you just move it on a bit? There was a little bit of, there's a sax we got. That's it. And then a bit more. Uh, just speed it up into the night time. Uh, we, had, we got a saxophonist. We had 
the, the air conditioning bit, you could actually pull these down, listen to music, and it piped cool air. So you can see there was the Heath Robinson bit. <laughs> and then just a little bit further on, saxophonist on one of the stages. And then finally at night, it was really good because we actually put UV paint on the undersides of the petals and then had these huge UV lights going up, which was obviously all run from, uh, from sustainable energy and, and our, our, our flex going into the office. But really good fun. I really enjoyed that. Thanks for that. So moving on. The Zeta. Uh, I might just, I was going to draw on the screen, um, but this, this is actually quite an interesting, um, I'll just do some of this here. This, this, was our, uh, this was for Lord Sainsbury. We were working for Sainsbury's, but this was Lord Sainsbury and his son. They decided to branch out into hotels. And this, the Zeta, I don't know if everyone knew, is actually the, the pools, the old pools um, sort of company. And when we first got into the building, which was this big warehouse at the bottom there, it was, um, all the machines were still there, and all the tickets. And we then went on a sort of roller coaster ride. It was a competition. David Age was already in place. But Paul Finch had said, I think you want to, you know, maybe want to have a think about another architect on this one. So we had to do a sort of beauty parade. And it was probably our best one because it encompassed a bit of art, a bit of the environmental side and a bit of wit. And I'll just quickly show you how that worked. If I, so basically a section, very crude section through the building. So we'll use that as, whoops. So we we'll use that as an idea, but brought, can't really see this. Anyway, broadly speaking, it was a sort of a corner, there we go, something like that, a corner building, as you can see, something like that. The thing was, when I was sketching, you weren't meant to put that up so that they could compare the sketch with the actual thing. But broadly speaking, there's the, there's the party wall on this side. Bloody great old warehouse, basically. And the great thing is, if you're ever doing a bit of architecture, if you can see what the previous architect has done, fantastic slingshot into a good idea. So we had a look at David Ajay's, and he's a great architect, I'm not rubbishing him, but I'm just saying that there was an opportunity here. So he'd actually got sort of staircases dotted all the way around, more or less. And obviously in London, very valuable, the external, for a hotel, extremely valuable. So we said, I'll tell you what, why don't we, first of all, put an atrium up the middle. Uh, we'll go for one staircase only, so get rid of these. And... We'll, um, we'll use that right down the middle of the hotel. Um, obviously, public rooms at the bottom. We'll put a, a borehole in down to the London Aquifer. I mentioned uh, Clerkenwell Gin Lane. The reason that's there is because there's an aquifer, water, on top of the clay, which people use for distilling gin. So we knew it was there. So we decided to plumb that. Um, the other thing was, it was in a conservation area. We were told we couldn't go higher than the top of the parapet, sort of there, um, from various sight lines, over here somewhere, something like that. And uh, we thought, well, first of all, if we, if, we put in, if we put a borehole in, we don't need as much water storage on the roof. So we've got the roof, but we can't go higher than the roof, it says. But we said, OK, say this is the, we reckon the sight lines are doing that in line with the parapet. We've actually got a cone on the top. So we've got, we've got some space because we've used water. The water's coming up to actually feed, obviously, the bedrooms, uh, to also cool the building, uh, also to go on the tables in the restaurant. Obviously, not necessarily in that order, but certainly helping out. Um, and there, also, we have natural ventilation going out through the roof, pulling out uh, hot air if necessary. Um, so natural ventilation is helping any mechanical ventilation. So we finished the presentation by saying, isn't that marvellous? And they said, oh, by the way, apart from the fact that we have got a strategy, uh, which is a single staircase, which means that smoke can be extracted through the middle, and um, we had to test that for the fire officer as we were building it, so it was a bit of a risk. Um, uh, so literally, the, it was a shell of a building. We had to mask off all the sides of this atrium as though it had been built. And then they did a smoke test to see if it all worked. And it did, thank God, with old Lord Sainsbury sort of breathing down your neck. You've got to be careful. Um, so he, so that all worked. Um, we put one staircase in and got away with that. And we ended up getting 12 extra rooms on it. Now, on a 60-bedroom a hotel, that was formidable. And the seven on the top, the penthouse lot, 
that just happened to clear all the space all the way around the hotel to see St Paul's, Tower Bridge and all those sort of, the, all the, the landmarks. So we, we sort of almost, he almost shook our hands at the presentation. And to do a presentation like that where you're using a bit of art, a bit of wit, the environment and an idea is fantastic. It's, it was a real thrill that was and that stands out in my mind and it was some time ago now. But uh, it's really worked out well. So we can have a look at some of those. I mean, it, this, this one at the top here is an extension which we didn't do. We, we project managed that. But it's a fairly eclectic hotel. That's the atrium. It goes all the way up between the two buildings. You can't see the penthouses on the top because of our sight lines, but they're there. So um, really enjoyable. It's where, that's why it's better than art sometimes, architecture, that project. Um, we went into another, <laughs> obviously there's lots of commercial stuff going on. I've picked out a few things. This is just simply a perfume garden we did for the Chelsea Flower Show, which was a great idea, we thought. Um, it was based on a spiral, again, art coming through, I suppose. And that's the thing I like about Chelsea, is it's a lot of art, a lot of landscape, architecture and landscape coming together with art. And uh, we found the old recipe of Elizabeth I perfume. She was the first person to bring perfume into the UK. She, she obviously, everybody smelt a bit in those days. She sent somebody out to the Middle East where they used it for religious ceremonies and so forth and found this particular perfume. We found the, the recipe. We went to Jean Patou, who was part of Procter & Gamble, not quite as glamorous, but Jean Patou, let's stick with them. Um, and they, he came up, well, not him, he's, I think he's probably dead, but he... he <laughs> But, but the brilliant, I was actually in the Zeta, had lunch with the, the nose, as they call them, the guy who does the perfume. And he came in with the perfume in this file. And it was something else because I thought, Christ, I might be the first person to have smelt that since the 16th century. And it was, it was amazing. And it, the, the amazing thing was we sold £20,000 worth at the show, which was uh, great. So we did a, we, the design was a still, a, a perfume still. The garden was what grows to make the perfume. That was the idea. And uh, these are some of the sketches that uh, we came up with. Um, and not only that, we went into a bit of fashion because we wanted to, to sell it um, in a certain way. So we looked at Elizabethan fashion and uh, did some sketches to try and take an extreme view of that. And then we were going to dress the girls up in those gowns, brushing past all the aromatic plants and try and get some publicity, basically, for our client. Um, so these were some of the images that came out of it. The still and the swirl was the aroma, if you like. And uh, another enjoyable thing that we sort of part financed and our client part financed as well. But um, something, um, the reason I'm showing you some of these is they all feed in, as you probably guess, into a certain shape for the last project. So there's a sort of fetish here for something tall and pointed, I think. But uh, it, it all, it all, it all came together in, a, in a quite a nice way. I put this one in simply because it's a, it's a big commercial project we're doing in Bath, which um, encompasses everything we've been doing over the years and, and not, doesn't quite bring us up to date. But it's, it's, it's trying to use the landscape once again, uh, which again you can see in the China project eventually. Uh, and it's a bit of art as well, trying to get a sculptural effect down to the river, but helping the ecology at the same time. So you can see the general idea there. Now, I just wanted to put Explore, Create and Make right in the middle of this because it's to help you guys, if I've learned anything on the way, that is quite an easy thing to put up, but it, there's a good reason for it. First of all, I never did the Explore bit. I think there are three important parts to any design process. Make sure you get your facts right. We were always told half an hour for an exam question, 20 minutes working out what you're going to say, 10 minutes writing it. Nobody ever does that. They usually go straight in, first paragraph rubbish, and then we might you might get it back on track. It's the same with architecture. If you, if you don't do that exploring bit at the beginning, try and ignore all the desires about what it should be or what it could be, and just concentrate on getting the information right, uh, you, you, you're going to set off in the right direction. So you're almost like um, pulling back a string on a bow. You want to pull that bow back and hold it for as long as you possibly can before you let go. If you, if you let go too fast or too early, it's a poor result. So the exploring is really important and how you explore is very important. It's quite a creative art. But what I sort of um, would quite like to do is just try and explore the bit which is the creative bit. Which, uh, so the, the plan is that if you count sort of all the exploration as a huge ammunition dump which is sitting there, 
waiting. So you, you've spent a lot of time and you've had a lot of self-discipline in not doing anything with that. You've just learnt to get to the point where you need the spark that sets off that ammunition, big explosion. Um, you need to get into. The, you need to be in the right. You need to be in the right frame of mind. Have the right condition. How many people here have actually been? desperate to get an idea and the more you try the worse it gets it's obviously it's a sort of writer's block isn't it it's a sort of uh if you're not in the right frame of mind well a few tips then to try and get out of it um i remember doing the diploma uh, might have been the degree and i was in that same situation and i was desperate and i was working every hour and i couldn't get it and i was getting worse and worse and it was getting more and more tied up and then we had to go on a trip for somewhere i can't remember where and I, the last thing i wanted to do went off on the trip, and it's almost as though your brain is still doing it for you. Mm. Happens to me on in tennis, actually. Um, uh, I can't do it in the lesson if I'm having a lesson at tennis, but then over the next week, my brain might work it out and I might go back and do it without even doing tennis again. And I think that happens in architecture. Your brain will continue to turn it over, and it'll, it, you just need something to change, to change the pattern of play. It's a bit like Mourinho throwing on three, three subs just to change change the pattern. It's not a Benitez type idea where you just stick with the formula. Okay? <laughs> the plan is to, to really get, get in amongst it and change it, but you've got to be at the in the right frame of mind. So I, I, I beg, find the right time of day, for instance, that you're best at. A lot of people are very good early on. Make sure you're designing with, with that in mind. Um, and relax. You have to somehow relax your brain. Now, obviously, alcohol is, is a possibility, and it seriously does work. That's, all sorts of reasons why people perform better because they're more relaxed. Russell Brand was always much better when he was on drugs of some sort. He's much, much funnier. <laughs> but I do think it's the same with design. It's not necessarily taking narcotics or, or alcohol. You've got to get into a state where you're relaxed and get self, they call it self one and self two. Self one is the one that says, oh Christ, I can't think. What am I going to do? Oh, I'm not going to make it. And then self two is, I, I can do without you saying that. I'll just do it. It's natural ability. You can do it. And you just have to push to one side and work out a way of relaxing and getting rid of the nag that's going on in your head. And it'll naturally happen. So there's a few, a few ideas there which, um, which set off the ammunition dump. And that eureka moment, talking about it with somebody is, is a really good idea. It doesn't have to be your idea. Somebody else's idea is brilliant. So... Um, uh, so that, that, there's lots of ways of doing that. But I'm sure you'll work them out, but there, there's, there's a few more, but I won't, we haven't got much time. That then leads on to the making. And the, the making, in my opinion, is, is one of the most important things and where most designs usually fail. Great idea, crap execution. Um, I, think, uh, I, think, uh, I think my tennis coach, what does he call it? He said it, that uh, shot that I just did was a, a bit of a scargill. He said it was um, great strike, poor result. Okay, so it, it's that in that case. You might have a brilliant idea, but if you don't get it built right, uh, it ends up being an explosion that doesn't happen. So uh, I do think getting, getting that bit right is uh, quite important. To find somebody on the technical side who understands how a design is properly put together is gold dust. Uh, I won't do another... Th uh, Chatterley Valley is a great job for us. Another, another reason, but I think we're probably running out of bloody time. So it is one of our best jobs for the same reason that Zeta is one of our best jobs. It, it's cleverness again, as well as architecture, in a pretty tricky sector where we've put a, basically a park in uh, which uses the water off the roof and preserves a much-loved path around the back of a pretty hostile environment on the other side, which is next to the railway line. It's... Um, it's a, it's a good, let me just show you. Up here, railway track. We put all the muck and bullets on this side. We, took the, we created a, a hill for people living in houses over here. There's a canal down here. And basically, people said, we love this walk through here to the park beyond over here. So we created a, a park environment which uses the water to water features off the roof. Uh, and hides all the, all the nastiness around the back next to the railway, state, the railway line. Um, and, uh, okay, it's a, it's a logistics building, a, a, a huge shed, but it's actually done in a very acceptable way and takes account of people and the way they live their lives. A bit more art. This was another 
A very quick one, this was about uh, the Barbican. Well, I was given the Barbican, you know, the big buildings in the background. Barbican used to be a graveyard um, uh, in the sort of Middle Ages. Uh, so I've turned the Barbican into uh, the actual buildings into sort of uh, the tombstone idea. Then it was populated, it was bombed to smithereens, not before everybody had been sent away on their sort of, uh, sorry, on their uh, sort of travels, evacuated, so all the evacuees around the side, now it's an art centre. So it's the embodiment, if you like, of the three phases of, uh, of, of the Barbican. Uh, final, final Chelsea Flower Show, B&Q, uh, just a nice little, little one there. That's, that's all done. It's a, a work of art, I think, but that's all done by school kids. It's an insect hotel. Each one in itself, not the best, but together, fantastic. And it was, uh, it was probably the, the star of the show. Gwyneth Paltrow opened the, the, uh, uh, the garden for B&Q, and it was uh, uh, quite, quite an incredible week that was. That was about, about 200 photographers right on the end of the, sort of the, the catwalk we not quite created for her. And uh, the judges were on the garden at the same time. They got barged to one side, and we thought, oh, God, that's our hopes of a medal gone. But uh, actually, it was all right. But, and she was actually as miserable as hell. But uh, <laughs> um, there you go. It was, it was still good fun. Um, just whip through some of these. The Andes house, you can see again, and this comes out a bit later on, this sort of flowering of an idea. So we used some of the ideas from the Oasis, which I showed you opening and shutting. This was a similar idea, but on a hilltop outside Chile, Santiago, in... Um, in the Andes, Andes house. Uh, more art, last one, that's the one this year to do with the shard. Uh, finally, uh, we get on to the Paper City, which was uh, uh, a Royal Academy show, which, uh, w which we uh, enjoyed, and it's sort of linked to the next project, which was a, a competition winning entry for the London Bridge, a reuse of the London Bridge, very similar to Heatherwick's idea, um, except this one was populated as it used to be, inhabited bridge. There used to be three stories running along this bridge in the 17th century. Uh, tricky space to apparently navigate, to say the least, but at least there was something to do along the way, all sorts of things. Um, and this was about um, a market, a vertical market um, in the middle, um, which is this one here, um, a wholesale market with farming actually in the in the Thames, and it's great. It's a sort of, it is very going back to, to college, really, with this sort of thing, but it's, it's fantastic fun. And then a, a public market alongside it. Um, and the plan was that this was supplied and, and actually ex imported and exported goods up and down the river, at last using the Thames as it used to be. So um, this was actually the start of our relationship with China, to some extent. Um, we, we were working uh, with, with uh, Gaisley, who had employed a Chinese lady who was very interested, was seconded to them. And uh, she'd seen the competition winning entry, and we were working already on quite an interesting project in logistics in China. Now, I'm going to introduce China in such a way that I've already told you what it's like to work in the UK. Quite tough um, by necessity. There's not enough, as much money as maybe in China, um, but it's a whiff of fresh air working for the Chinese. Whether you get paid is another matter, but they are so enthusiastic. Um, they embrace ideas. If you come up with an idea, it's actually going to get bigger or better, not the other way, which happens in the UK for good reasons sometimes. So this one is a logistics park, which um, we normally deal in, OK, maybe a million square feet for a single, single warehouse. And the sort of land take on that, Tim, would be, what, how many acres? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, mate. Sorry, <laughs> mate. <laughs> well, not, not that many acres. Well, the one we were doing in, in China, in Wuhan, is 21 square kilometres. Okay, it's sort of an incredible scale. And um, uh, I, I just, sort of jaw-dropping, I was thinking, God, I, I, it turned out that their logistics space, distribution, is nil, more or less. It's about the same the amount they've got in Boston, proper logistics space. So... We really, we, I got a whiff of what, what was, this was about by the size of that and, um, uh, and their optimism, actually, as a nation. It's actually uh, great real optimism in terms of what's ahead. I guess it might have been that sort of enthusiasm back in maybe the 19th century. Um, so you can see the size of it. It's, it's um, really, really quite a, a formidable project. We also got involved, and this is a project, a competition you might all like to get involved with. It's called Malewa. 
it's where the cli our client's parents lived and died, and he has taken it upon himself to create a sort of utopian vision of a, a town or a city. Now, there are enough of those in China to put anybody off. This one is something different. The idea here is that everything that visits or, or, or arrives at this town leaves in a better state. So that could be the air, could be water, could be people, could be how much you learn as you arrive and leave and so forth. So it's a sort of utopian vision uh, to some extent, but it's, uh, it's basically a competition which has 13 opportunities with quite a large prize money attached, um, which I would uh, impress upon you. So Malaywa is the actual word and it's been reasonably well publicized. Um, so that broadly is, is it. There's a flower ocean which is being built at the moment around the edge of it, the world's largest flower garden, and then these plots, broadly speaking, have been placed up for grabs in terms of competition with an uh, interdenominational centre which allows people to arrive and worship and, and leave right in the middle. It's, it's quite an interesting uh, proposition, mainly because the prize money is so huge. Um, that, that was taken out. So, on to the China project. After the London project, we... Uh, the London Bridge project, uh, the lady in question said, look, we really, we're really interested in a site right in the middle of Wuhan, which is uh, a fantastic opportunity for you if you're interested. Now, if you don't mind, and it's always bloody uh, tedious when people start going back, but we did have this in a slightly different way. Um, if I just show you here, this is Wuhan, right? It's called the City of a Thousand Lakes. Very rare that you get a city um, with these sort of spaces with the, the sort of lakes involved. Now, this is only a section of it, and it's a drawing I did just to show the site. The site itself is there. It's a lake in its own right. Um, this is the Yangtze running across here. And it's about three kilometres from a, an existing conference centre, which is in the middle there, and three kilometres back to our site. Completely dead straight road. They said, this, this, we've got an Australian uh, architect already on this. Can you have a quick look at it? And he put in a completely flat, two-storey, uh, idea, tourist destination, right in the middle of this lake. And I thought, well, oh, Christ, uh, we've actually got a three kilo at least a three kilometer vista and beyond both ways. We've got a, it's quite a built up city, despite some of the CGI's you've seen. It's a, it's, it's a modern city um, of about 10 million people and uh, it's built up. But all the way around our site is, compl is just a lake, it's sort of swamp, but a lake. Um, and it's a fantastic opportunity. You just don't get these spaces in such a big city. So I, I immediately thought, well, actually, this is a, possibly a, an opportunity to put an iconic structure in. There's been lots in the press, hasn't there, about, oh, uh, uh, ego boosts and ego trips for architects and what's the point? Well, I thought this one actually did have a, have a point. And uh, we, we set about looking at an idea which would, uh, you could read right through the centre of Wuhan and take advantage of... Uh, take advantage of the site. The actual, the, this is a slightly tricky bit, I suppose, in that the Chinese are incredibly optimistic, as I mentioned, but they've also got quite a, uh, a lot of the West look upon their ideas as being slightly tacky. I, I sort of disagree. They, they've are, they want to recreate at the bottom of this particular project, the world. So there are about five streets, big streets, which come from each part of the world, Japan, Turkey, France, China. And uh, they want to recreate almost the setting of those streets. Now, you know, architects look down their noses at sort of pastiche stuff. But if you think about it, not everybody in China can actually get out of China. And they have had to rely on going to see things uh, within their own country. So it is, I think, excusable. And I, I, I think it's ironic in some ways that commentators say, oh, uh, you know, they're nicking ideas and they're putting them up in ridiculous places. We did that back in the sort of the trips to Italy and back again. We built Italian-esque and Romanesque architecture from around the world. And it, it's, it's a, it, it sometimes is, I think, excusable. So moving on, we, we started to look at, at the, the idea. And uh, the metaphors that were beginning to come out were that... Uh, it had to be tall. Uh, we also wanted to grab the microclimate high up. It's subtropical at, in Wuhan. So we wanted to get some of the cooler air higher up. We wanted to use that, the wind speeds higher up as well for our wind turbines to get some, some power. But you can see some of this leads back to some of that oasis work that we did 
and some of the other structures, we use some of our knowledge to, to really go for it in this way. These are some of the, some of the early sketches. This is the sort of road, the road, the axis that goes right up for three kilometres both ways. And this is the start of um, the different uh, ideas at the base of this subject. So the idea is that this lot says Wuhan. And every bloody, every city in China is trying to say something. Look, look at me. We want to be known and we want people to come to Wuhan. So it's blatant that they do want and need something like this to say something about the city of a thousand lakes. So rather than just gratuitously going for it in, by putting up an icon, we wanted those things to work for us. This goes back to some of the projects that I've talked about here. Look nice, but actually do something clever. So could we, all the lake, these lakes, this lake is linked to all the other lakes. The lakes aren't in a great state. Could we use these structures to purify the water and possibly some of the air pollution? Uh, could we also make a statement and could we make sure that what we're doing here isn't just gratuitous? So we did, we put a lot of effort into that. And these are just some of the sketches that I, I did to try and get, get these to work. And we, we, we also picked up the tradition of two towers, which is the, the Chinese version of the phoenix, uh, not in terms of the West. There were two dragons, the phoenix, male and female. So these two towers represent male and female. Um, and you can see that. So uh, if I just flick through some of these, these are all quite similar. But... Uh, we slowly came to an idea and then uh, brilliantly we, uh, we got a CGI man from Shanghai to actually do the, do, the, do the CGIs and then I took that off him and uh, took it on to the next stage. But you can see some of, the, uh, some of the sort of natural metaphors coming through that we started to use. Um, this is basically for entertainment in the bay, so to speak. And these, this is just a SketchUp model as a base and uh, we took it a stage further. Um, and then I did a sketch over the top to try and give them the idea of what we were, would be looking at. And then this is quite an interesting one, uh, which I uh, picked up. Quite a few of these are actually projects you've already seen. Um, Andy's house. Uh, these are actually the Oasis idea, but, but really it was a selling job. We had to go to the uh, mayor of Wuhan to sell him this idea. So the two ideas are that there are two thermal chimneys running up through both, both of the towers. Um, photovoltaics on both elevations, a wind turbine on this one, and most of this is powering this. Um, the lower level is obviously all to do with tourism, um, and it's going up that high, a kilometre high, because it's trying to grab this uh, subtropical, or sorry, a different uh, environment to try and, try and cool things down. Um, Evaporative cooling, rainwater harvesting, all the sort of environmental stuff we've learnt over the years from very good commercial projects that we've done. Green wall right up the middle, the world's tallest green wall right up the middle, which is more leisure. Um, this is more um, commercial and residential. Um, and so the first iteration uh, came out and I, I sort of, I took that, that final image, if you like, and uh, we used the, the fuchsia which you can see there, the fuchsia flower, to give it that pink look. It was, it was a bit whimsical, but I, I do think uh, there's no harm or being ashamed in, in, in actually going for pink or, or reds. It's a fantastic colour. I think as architects we tend to go monochrome too readily. Cars are far too often silver, white and grey and black, and uh, there should be a little bit more fun. I think human beings need colour. Um, and I think uh, overall, although I'm afraid the CGI man sort of missed out half the, uh, half the buildings. Um, it still it doesn't quite stand out quite as much as that. And this is the, the bit that actually makes the money for the, our esteemed client, but actually is of some use to a lot of people in China as well, we hope. Um, can we have a look at the animation on that? The animation's a fairly crude sort of uh, um, a sketch up model, but it's still, still good. I mean, Sorry, it, it actually, uh, it's quite interesting. The guy had said, he told us all about this and we did take up, you know, said, oh God, you know, Arc de Triomphe in Wuhan, a bit, bit tough to take. And then he said he, the client wants some uh, 
restaurants which represent Venus and Mars and a celestial idea. So we, we took, in the spirit of the thing, well, what do you think if we sort of uh, suspend the restaurants actually between the two towers and use skywalks <laughs> to actually get to them? And, of course, in England, it would have been, for Christ's sake. <laughs> and uh, actually, um, they said, well, I love that idea. And we spent a whole day in Wuhan with the engineers working out how we were going to do it. Uh, please don't ask me how we're going to do it. But uh, <laughs> it was... Uh, it was great fun, and our trip there was fantastic. I mean, the thing is, what you do is, local authority in England, you know what local authorities are like, we end up uh, meeting everybody, everybody's very pleasant, and we go away. In, in China, you have a big meeting with a load of people, um, and then at the end of it, you have a banquet, and you, eat, you get these shots of um, rice wine, you have to toast everybody around the table. If it's a 20-person uh, meeting, and you've got another presentation and another meeting after that. Uh, I mean, God knows how they, they went back to work after that. It was f fantastic, but it was just the, s the spirit of it all um, was, was great. And I honestly don't care if that isn't built or we don't get paid. We did get paid. We broke even on this one so far. I don't really care because we've had a brilliant time doing it. And I guess, I, to sum up my whole presentation, I, I really have enjoyed some of the high points of architecture um, and I recommend it to you but make sure that you're doing what you love and try and steer your careers in the direction that that probably where your heart lies which is the art for me and the landscape and the ecology and the environment and I think uh, you'll come out on top anything you do that you like you probably end up being quite good at so thank you very much Thank you, Laurie, for that. I think it's been very insightful for a lot of our graduate students and especially to some of the other professionals that are in here as well to get a bit of a closer glimpse at the type of work that Chetwitz has done over the years. And I'd like to welcome questions for any of the students that may have some questions for Laurie just before you move on into the <coughs> exhibition space. So, anybody have any questions in the last 10 minutes? How did you get away with the one stair in there? Uh, no, that's a good point. Uh, yeah, it's good. Don't go and stay there, will you? <laughs> um, we, uh, I was surprised. I was surprised. We, it was the smoke, actually. The smoke was the big problem. And the fact we've got these uh, louvers at the top of the atrium that automatically open when there's a problem demonstrated that we could get an updraft. And uh, as I say, it was tested, and they thought that was fine. In terms of actual uh, distance, it just happened that the staircase was in the right position for both both ways around the atrium but um, it was uh, it was a quite a tense moment two tense moments on that was actually waiting for the water to come up from the borehole which it didn't start with and uh, 30,000 pounds looked as though it would have been missed and then um, that one when the, when the smoke test worked but um, uh, Lord Sainsbury was the other interesting part of that as I say it's great to, to enjoy yourself and he was one of those guys that had a sort of twin twin, he had sort of good cop, bad cop all in one, so he could be going along nicely and you think this is great and he'd suddenly turn on you and say what the hell do you think you're doing? So it was actually, uh, uh, every month was quite an interesting event for me. <laughs> I was in that awful position of not actually being totally involved with the detail but he thought I was, so yeah, interesting. Um, how does nature influence your mindset to architecture and design? Uh, it's, it's huge actually, I, I think uh, if I could, um, if architecture was a bit more flexible and the clients were more uh, flexible, uh, I think that there's so many things in nature that uh, we could look to. And, and you can see it in product design now, can't you? So many things are organic and are sh following the shape of the hand. And, and it's beginning to come through in architecture, but it's slow. And I think, uh, for me, it's not quick enough. I, I'd love to love that side of things. But, but every time you put pen to paper in the real world, you know that a, a curved line or a monocoque structure or anything like that is going to be expensive and if you're working in the commercial world you're going to get knocked in the UK anyway. Uh, I think abroad that's not quite the case anymore so it's beginning to change. Thanks for the question. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned about uh, being relaxed um, to get ideas. Um, apart from <laughs> what else would you recommend um, or is that the only 
formula. <laughs> no, that's a good point. I, I think, funny enough, it's a similar thing to successful architecture. If you've got, if you take the five senses and you're more or less satisfied, say, say I'm sitting in the Zeta now and it's not too noisy, uh, I can't smell them frying onions and uh, uh, the, the temperature's right, um, uh, etc., etc. I, I'm feeling really relaxed and I'm enjoying it. I'm in the swim of it. I've, I've got that sort of feel-good factor, um, a satisfaction of some description. As soon as they open the doors, test the fire, the vents and the roof gets too cold or they do start frying onions, it interrupts. So I think getting yourself comfortable and relaxed and in a nice environment, a good environment for you, is, is a good one. I love being in a sort of slightly busy place. I couldn't go and sit in a room with, you know, in the, in the garden, so that, like the writer goes out into the garden shed and, and uh, uh, you know, tries to come up with an idea. That would kill me. But to actually be slightly distracted by things going on around me, uh, it frees up the mind. It means you're not thinking, oh Christ, what, is, what am I trying to get to? Uh, you need to somehow look for ways of throwing the joystick around a bit. And I'm sure sportsmen, for instance, um, are best when they're not thinking about it too much. Um, uh, and letting the natural side of your game come through. But, um, so I'd say the sense is getting, getting what you find as comfortable and relaxed and quite difficult though. Uh, <laughs> sometimes, it, and I, that was the other thing I was going to say, if, if you find it's not working, but you've still got to produce something, put, put it down, the, the bit you can't get, and do something which is productive, which will get you something towards the end of the day. So at least you bank that, bang and then go back to it. Because how many times have we all tried for the one idea and ended up at the end of the evening thinking, Christ, I've done nothing. Um, uh, so it is always a good idea to bank, a bit like uh, Countdown or whatever it is. Is it Countdown? No, not Countdown. That awful thing with Anne Robinson, where you, you bank the money. You want to bank something that's productive and that sometimes jogs your, pr products, your creative production. It gives you a chance to regroup, so to speak. So it's not a bad idea, that. Yeah. Laurie, you, you were mentioning in your presentation about the Explore Create Make uh, bit, and you hinted on the technical backup that you rely on to sort out and a lot of the, the art problems that you see. Um, can you just explore that? Yes, I'm, I must say, I haven't, in all the time we've worked at Chetwoods, not many, we've not had much good technical backup. It really, um, because it's a different approach, it's rare that you find somebody who's meticulously accurate and clever and uh, aware of all the technical possibilities and has a flair on the design side so they understand the initial concept and can take it into another area. So in other words, there's loads of technical people out there who will do exactly what you ask them to do and, but, but you're still looking for that explosion of ideas beyond the, the initial one. You still want lots of small explosions as you carrying on. So you're getting another, oh gee, because so many ideas come from other people. Might be, even be a QS, you never know. Um, when, you, <laughs> when you're around a table, it doesn't matter where it comes from, I think it's great to have a group of people. And as I say, it could be your gran or it could be uh, anybody. And you're just knocking the ideas around and you're almost using people as a sounding board. And I think the technical side it's great to have a quantity surveyor in there because they can say that's... And they, the good thing about... This is the rare thing that's happening, well, it's quite often happening now, is that you get... Uh, the project is, is worked up and then it goes off to the cost consultant. They go and do it somewhere else and then it comes back and they say, well, sorry, I can't afford it. But if you once more get back into a group session with the client, the contractor, perhaps, if he's in already, and the quantity surveyors, all the, all the consultants actually do the bloody design there and then on a screen even if it takes two days, you'll actually get a better job because the architect is kept in check, or at least he understands the problems of other people and they understand your problems. How many project managers have, have we come up against who are just out to make sure it's on time and on money, I don't give a stuff. If they're involved in the process, then they own part of it and they're keen for it to be successful and to get the best result. It's a good atmosphere in a team then. And to get back to that would be great. And... Um, uh, we, we try and do that, and that's where the architect should be uh, in this sort of arbiter of ideas, coming in and then selecting and discussing and collaborating. And that seems to have been lost in the UK. I think the architects are seen as a bit of a pain in the neck, which is a complete fallacy. Yeah. 
How important is it to have an architectural technologist on a project and what advice would you give them? How important? And how important is it to have an architectural technologist on a project and what, what advice would you give them? Oh, I think it's, in, well, as I say, incredibly important. I think uh, if you don't have the right technologists, if you like, going into this, you, your best ideas are lost. And how many times have I sort of seen what was a good idea come, you know, hit, the, hit, you know, hit, what am I trying to say? Hit something. <laughs> <laughs> well, hit, <laughs> hit rock bottom, something like that. So it, it's incredibly important. <coughs> what do you think about the increasing role of uh, IT in building design in terms of its effects on creativity? I, th I think it's fantastic, actually. Uh, all those drawings that you saw that I did are all done on a tablet. And, uh, and interesting, I was in a, a competition for art, just an art competition, and I um, can't remember his name now. A famous architect was the, were giving out the prizes, basically. He said, isn't it brilliant? And he looked around, all, around the room and said, all these works of art, and there's not a computer in sight. Uh, it's absolute rubbish. It's sort of, um, it shouldn't be seen as a... As for an artist, it's brilliant. I mean, if you take Photoshop, you've got all the colours you want. You've got every opacity, every layer. You can turn things off if it looks crap. It's just, it's brilliant. In fact, it's almost too much. The only downside is that, uh, as an artist, the, the, the screen somehow stops something. I don't know what it is. It's so much better, actually, on paper. Uh, you feel as though you're really with it. But the actual, the, the technology is, is opens up a huge amount. It probably compensates for that. So that's only a very small part, I realise. Um, the technology that speeded everything up and uh, communications have moved on. I'm not sure if that necessarily helps with the process because uh, not a, as much care is taken these days with some of the things that we do. We just have to go to Paddington Basin to have a look at that and some of the things we've done as well. Yeah. Um, thank you for the presentation. What is the impact of these visual representations, regardless if it's only 3D or use of other technology, on the presenting performance? Do you intend to represent performance to these images? And if so, what, how do you intend to copy some of the intangibles when you want to communicate with the client? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't hear some of that, unfortunately. So just can you praise it? Can you put that in, sort of, uh, in a few words? How do you represent performance within your Information. Well, it's going back to the previous question, actually. There's a fantastic package now, which is called BIM, which, if this is what you mean, which, is, which basically uh, charts the progress of a project. And if you use it with the very artistic side, it's a fantastic opportunity because it not only governs the performance of a building while you're doing it and all the team buy into it, but it actually governs the performance of a building beyond the time you hand it over for a client. So it's an incredibly useful tool which we're using and a lot of architects are using uh, to, to uh, manage the process. Um, it sounds, sounds grim, great opportunity for architects um, to grab before uh, the usual suspects jump in and get it from us. So I do think that's a, a, worthy, a worthy tool. Do you think it can, bridge the, the, it can bridge the gap between what you can see or what, you, what is visualized and the lived experience? Uh, in terms of atmosphere, you're talking about? In terms of atmosphere or in terms of information that you can actually represent? Because you know you can't represent everything. No, that's for sure. I'm afraid that's where you go to self too, I think, and you're looking at instinct taking over from formula. I, I, do, I do think we're missing that as well as one of my big bugs is that, uh, again, self too, let, let your own personality and your own... It, uh, natural ability come through and not necessarily, I think there are a lot of architects who do things because they've seen it before or and it's been done before and you, you can actually I think uh, relax a bit and try and use your own but that is a difficult thing to actually put down on paper I agree, it's an instinctive thing and uh, I often well, personally I often draw things, I think well, it's obvious that's going to be fine that's going to look great but it doesn't necessarily come across to the client <laughs> so uh, there you go We've got room for one last question, and then after that, you can feel free to have a look at some of the artwork that's displayed in the classroom. So we've got last question. You have a raft to... yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As a final year student, I think like the scariest thing is is sort of getting out there into the real world and how to approach companies and being yeah. 
recognised, I guess. So what advice would you give us on how to approach this? Uh, I would uh, imagine all the people that are in your position and think of a way of getting ahead. And it, it happens um, every so often I'm surprised by somebody doing something which makes them stand out. So, uh, for instance, a bloke uh, way beyond your years um, who literally had put a bespoke presentation together for us, came to the office with it. I know that, that does happen quite a lot anyway, but and he got my name on it. Uh, so sort of an element of flattery is involved. And, uh, but the bloke's made an effort and, it, and it, he's had the wit too. So it goes back to sort of looking, having a bit of wit, uh, researching your subject um, and getting across the threshold. It's quite difficult, I know. You, you, you've got to try and imagine the number of other CVs that are coming across and to whom it may concern when doesn't cut much with me. And, uh, and so the personalised effort that somebody's gone to, uh, to to make it stand out, we're constantly trying to do that ourselves in a way. And um, uh, we won the Clapham sort of supermarket by pitching for that as a beauty parade. Well, we, we made, we literally made the model and lit, lit up when you opened the box. It was all that sort of crap. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was a sort of jack-in-the-box type idea. And it, but it caught their imagination and, and we won it in quite a difficult circle. So I would say try and distinguish yourself in, in the way that you, you get that initial get noticed. Um, it's not easy, that's not a great answer, but those are the ones that, that I notice, the different ones. Think of 19 people out of 20, you want to be the 20th, the one with a different idea, and uh, you might get somewhere. It's, it's not easy, I agree. <laughs> not easy. Um, yeah. Was an interview of Laurie Baker, uh, the profile of an architect by uh, He had mentioned that in today's world, most of the buildings, if they put in the uh, same location, they would look the same. They do not influence, they will not have an influence of local architecture. Now, as an experienced designer, what is your view about modern style of architectural design? I, I think it as I've gone on, I've found that architecture is a bit flawed for that reason, actually. And, and the worst thing, from my point of view, is that uh, there's something strange about it. It's a bit like Paddington Basin, actually. The, and anywhere, a lot of the places in the, in the Far East as well, where you've got lots of different buildings going up willy-nilly. Uh, from the day they go up, they're becoming obsolete. Um, they're not getting better, like some of the older buildings have. Some of the materials we use aren't particularly uh, as before. Um, and as you say, it's, it's fairly, this is the disappointing thing for me. Actually, because you have to accommodate people and the shapes that they form around the, the people they're accommodating, it's quite difficult to do something, which is lovely, I think. And uh, uh, the point about whether they're relating to particular areas or not, well, it's becoming a, sort of, a bit like language is sort of becoming universal. I think, unfortunately, the style is as well. And, and then you get the ridiculous... The sublime going to the ridiculous, where people start trying to do, trying too hard. Um, so, a bit disappointed at the moment. I was sort of looking almost, I think it was Rogers who said, if you look across a landscape, the first thing you hit as an impediment is a building. And it's, um, it's a sad thing that that's, that's often the case. And uh, then often, if, if you took a building out of its context and said, I'll wear that as a piece of jewellery, well, you wouldn't because it's not a beautiful thing. I don't think there are many beautiful things, and I don't believe that uh, beauty is in the eye of the beholder for a lot of things. I think they are often ugly to most people. So um, uh, n not a very optimistic end to this talk, really. <laughs> That's it, I think. Thank you very much, Laurie. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.